Hi everyone. Uh, I am Ayipal Kasania. I am a PhD student in concrete materials uh, at the University of New Brunswick. In today's presentation, I will talk about the importance of the fineness or the particle size of harvested fly ash and ground glass fuselants. This research was done under the supervision of my supervisor, Dr. Michael Thomas at UNB. Before I dive into the research done at UNB, I will briefly talk about different pozzolanic materials that are used in concrete currently, their benefits and challenges the industry is facing in using some of the popular materials. I will then talk about the investigations done to determine the mineral content, uh, amorphous content, and the reactivity of some fuselants using different test methods. Finally, I will wrap up the presentation with concluding remarks. Uh, well, they, there are a wide range of fuselants that can be used to partially replace the Portland cement in concrete. And over the past a few decades, some of these materials have shown a great improvement in the long-term performance of concrete, provided these materials are used in adequate proportions. Uh, Flyes is the most commonly used fuselant in producing blended cements. Uh, this material is produced as an industrial byproduct at coal-based power stations. Uh, fly ash particles are mainly spherical in shape, and when they are used in concrete, it improves the workability. In turn, the water content of the mix can be reduced. Uh, here is an example of uh, a low calcium or class F fly ash, which contained high proportion of silica and alumina. These silica and alumina in concrete react with uh, calcium hydroxide and water and then forms additional hydrates, which hydrate improve the performance of concrete. A study was done to determine the performance of fly ash samples in a long term. Uh, they produce samples with fly ash and without fly ash. The samples was exposed to a marine environment for 24 years. The samples were brought back to the lab and tested for chloride concentration and different depths. Here, as we can see that the control mix or the 100% Portland cement mix has chlorides penetrated more than 100 millimeters. Whereas the mix with the fly ash has chlorides penetrated up to 30 millimeters. It means the chloride penetration in the fly ash concrete decreased by over 70%. Although fly ash is such a good material, but there are certain challenges that we are going to face in the future when using fly ash in concrete, mainly because the availability of the fly ash is expected to decline due to, uh, due to termination of coal-based power generating stations in many country to meet the climate goals. Here are some statistics that shows that uh, the coal consumption in the UK declined by nearly 46% in the past decade. It means the fly ash production also declined in a similar ratio. At the same time, the data from uh, American Coal Ash Association shows that fly ash production also decreased by 57% in the decade. At the same time, the fly ash consumption was more or less the steady. It means in the next coming years, not too long, there will be a time when the fly ash demand would be higher than its supplies. So in order to meet that challenge, there is a growing interest in looking at alternative materials. In this presentation, I will mainly focus on uh, harvested coal ash and ground glass. Coal ashes uh, that were not used in concrete or in other applications were stored in ponds or landfill sites could now be used as, as a concrete fuselant. However, there are certain challenges in using these materials in concrete. The main challenges are the moisture content, LOI, and the fineness of the harvested ash, because these properties vary significantly even within a source, and they might vary a lot when uh, vary a lot from one source to another source. And the reason behind these changes is that the ash that has been in the, in the pond or the landfill site have, has uh, weathered over time and 
the S that has been dumped over over the decades could be a combination of both fly S as well as bottom S. Here is a study the, that shows that the harvested fly S shows a wide range of performance. But if the harvested fly S is ground to fine, it can perform better than the control mix, especially at later ages when the pozzolanic reaction reaches to higher degree. Uh, a huge quantity of waste glass is produced in every country every year, but only a small portion is recycled. Uh, the majority of the waste glass comes from uh, plates and containers, which can be used to produce type GS ground glass. The other type of waste glass comes from fiberglass reinforcements. It is a very low quantity, but it can be used to produce a low alkali or type GE ground glass. Uh, the waste glass could be turned into a reactive material when it is ground to a micron particle sizes. And here, here is an example that shows that if the ground glass is ground to finer and finer, its reactivity linearly increases. At early ages, at three days or seven days, there is not a huge change in strength development when comparing with the different glasses, but there's a huge at 91 days when the pozzolanic reaction has progressed a lot. Due to the pozzolanic properties of ground glasses, these materials can improve several mechanical and durability properties of concrete, especially when we talk about ASR, that is a different case because high alkali ground glasses are not that effective. Uh, in this study at UNB, we looked at two ground glasses from two different sources, and both ground glasses have very similar chemistry. They have silica, alumina, and iron content very comparable. At the same time, they have really high alkali content, which is not an issue when we are looking at only, when we are looking at these materials only from reactive, reactivity perspectives. There's a new specification developed recently to see, uh, to qualify these materials and the materials used in this study qualify for type GS ground glasses. These materials were also uh, analyzed for their uh, amorphous content and the types of mineral phases present. Quantitative oxide diffraction was used. These pozzolans were mixed with an internal standard of non-crystallinity using a micronizing mill to produce a homogeneous mix. That mix was then used to, uh, used to conduct the X-ray diffraction. And then later on, the data was analyzed to uh, determine the amorphous content and the mineral phases in their content. The XRD result here shows that uh, these ground glasses are entirely amorphous. There is no crystalline phases present in the samples. However, the peaks we see here belong to the internal standard root tile that we used. There are no other peaks. It means these glasses are entirely amorphous. And when we look at the specification, C1866, they easily meet the minimum requirement of 95%. In addition to the ground glasses, we also looked at a couple of fly assays. One of the, uh, uh, basically these two fly assays are uh, low calcium or class F fly assays. One of them was directly received from a coal-based plant. And the other one was produced at the plant, but it was uh, put in a landfilling site for a few years and then it was harvested and brought to the lab for reactivity investigations. As we can see here, the harvested ash and the parent ash that was produced at the plant have a very similar chemistry. There's not a huge change in the, in the composition of silica, alumina, and iron. And the, and the slight change in the chemistry could be due to mainly weathering effects or a variation in the in the chemistry of the coal that was used at the plant over time. When we look at the uh, composition of silica, alumina, iron, the harvested S as well as the fly S meet the classification of class F pozzolans according to C618. Uh, the, the quantitative X-ray diffraction result shows that uh, both the ashes, fly S as well as the harvested S contain amorphous phases, which can be seen from the, from the hum between 20 to 30 degrees, degrees two theta. Both assays contain uh, the same mineral phases, 
However, the proportion of the phages is a little bit different from one S to another S. This is again male. It could be due to an effect of weathering effect or a variability in the coal used to produce these assays. However, the amorphous content of these assays is, is really consistent and which will also see uh, that their reactivity is also comparable in the next coming slides. But, but uh, this is really uh, uh, positive to see that the amorphous content of a harvested S does not change a lot when compared to its parent S. We, we also looked at a highly reactive metachylene to see how the other materials, the fly ashes and the ground glasses perform as compared to this one. Um, metachylene is basically a can signed clay. It, is, it contains high proportion of silica and alumina. When we conducted QXRD, we found out that the metachylene contains two crystalline phages. One is quartz and the other is kaolinite. It has, sli it has slightly lower amorphous content as compared to the fly ashes as well as the ground glasses. However, it has a high reactivity. It, that is mainly because of its uh, finer particle size and high specific surface area. Uh, the particle size uh, distribution of the pozzolans were determined using laser diffraction. The graph that we obtain from, uh, from uh, laser diffraction can be used to determine the different values. We can also determine D10, D50, and D90. But here in this research, we mainly focused on D50 because D50 gives a good idea of uh, the average particle size of the materials. And several research papers have shown that D50 is better than using uh, particles passing uh, 45 microns. The glasses used in this study were ground to part four different particle sizes ranging from 2.3 microns to about 15 microns. Similarly, the harvested fly ash was also ground from three microns to 13.5 microns. However, the fly ash was kept to the same as the received particle size. Metacaline was already fine, so it was not ground to any different particle size. In the re reactivity investigations, we selected three different test methods, which used three different uh, um, mixer designs and the binder composition. So the first two tests uh, involved preparation of two inches mortar cubes, and then we cured the mortar cubes at 40 degrees Celsius for seven days in the UNB lime reactivity test and until 28 days in the modified C618. The lime reactivity or the UNB lime reactivity test were developed by me and my supervisor during my master's year. And right now uh, the test is in a round robin study to see whether it is repeatable and reprodu reproducible between different labs. Uh, in, uh, in the modified C618 test, uh, we kept the water to binder ratio constant as a, opposed to the existing SAI or CXC C618 test. Or, and we also cured the samples at high, high temperature as opposed to 23 degrees Celsius. In both the tests, we tested cubes for bulk electric load resistivity first, and then for compressive strength. On the other hand, in the bound water test, paste samples were produced and then cured at 40 degrees Celsius for seven days. And at the end of the test, the, uh, the samples were first dried at 40 degrees Celsius in an oven, then at 350 degrees Celsius in a furnace. And the mass loss between these two temperatures were determined as bound water. The results of the UNB lime reactivity test are shown here. The graph on the top shows the compressive strength development of the cubes at seven days. And the bottom graph shows the bulk electrical resistivity of the same cubes. Here is a classification developed uh, to give an idea of how the material reactive is. So if the cubes of a material achieve less than two MPA strength at seven days, it means it has negligible reactivity. If the materials cube have uh, two to five MPS strength, low reactivity, five to 10 moderate. And for high reactivity, the strength should be between 10 to 20 MPA. And as we can see that there's a, a significant benefit of grinding this material to fine particle sizes. Both the glasses show an increase in strength values as well as the harvested flyers, which on the other hand, show a little bit lower impact, but still the strength values are increasing. 
the glasses which are ground to really fine, they were close to two micron size or three micron size, they perform comparable to the highly reactive metachyoline. Similar trends in results were observed in the bulk resistivity. The bulk resistivity of the cubes increased as the particle size of the pozzolans were decreased. Uh, resistivity is a little bit more complex property than strength because it is impacted by several parameters, including microstructural quality, the composition of the microstructure, and the pore solution composition. So that is shown here as well, because the, these high alkali ground glasses have high pore solution alkalinity or composition, it means they have lower resistivity. We see that harvested fly assays have a little bit higher resistivity as opposed to the ground glasses. The second test performed in motor was the modified C618 test. Uh, there was a control mix tested uh, at different ages and blended mixes containing ground glasses and harvested fly assays and metacaline were produced at a 20% replacement level. The metacaline, the strength for the metacaline cubes are significantly higher than the control mix even as seven days because of the metacaline is highly reactive. Uh, the results for the other materials for ground glasses and harvested fly ash shows that the, the strength values are slightly lower when these materials have larger particle size, for example, 15 microns. The strength values are lower at seven days, but over time, as these materials react in the prosolenic reaction, their strength values increase. However, the ultimate strength values at 28 days are still lower. But when these materials are ground to fine particles, for example, 3 MPa, the strength values catch up or maybe they overpass the strength of the control mix at 28 days. Uh, the second test performed on these cubes was the bulk electrical resistivity. As compared to the strength, the impact of the pozzolanic reactivity on the resistivity of cube is more pronounced. The Portland cement cubes or the 100% PC cubes have a uh, bulk re resistivity of around four kilo ohm centimeter, whereas the mixes with metacaline has around 60. So that is almost a factor of 15. However, from the results, we can see that we can compare materials to see if the reactivity is increasing or not when we decrease the particle size. All the materials have lower uh, uh, bulk resistivity than the metacaline mixes. However, the smaller particle size have lower uh, bulk resistivity, but it increases as the particle size of the material decreases. And in all cases, as we can see that when the particle size is around 3, M, 3 microns, the electric resistivity is quite high as compared to the 15 micron size. Um, this is the final test that we conducted to evaluate reactivity. This is the newly developed ASTM C1897 bond water test. From the results, Ahipal, we we're almost the, out of time. So if you can quickly wrap up. Oh, oh, oh yeah, sure. So in this test, we also see that the uh, bond water content of uh, materials increases as their particle size decreases. However, the values are still lower than that of the metacaline. So from the, uh, the resistive, uh, reactivity results, we can see that the reactivity of materials sort of increases as we decrease the particle size and there's a linear correlation. This correlation can be explained by this uh, phenomena here. As we decrease the particle size of the materials, the specific surface area increases. In turn, the proportion of the material that is exposed to the Portland dye and the alkaline solution also increases. It means there's a less amount of material that is anhydrous that is entrapped between the hydrates. Um, from the amorphous content, we can see that metacaline has lower amorphous content as compared to the other ones, but is has the highest reactivity. It means amorphous content cannot be used as a parameter to determine reactivity. From the reactivity results, uh, I developed a index using amorphous content as well as the D50 or the average particle size. And we can see that this index uh, well correlate with the strength results. However, this is quite preliminary. We would need more data uh, to see if such index is valid or not. In conclusion, ground glass and harvested fly ash are puzzling materials and their reactivity is highly dependent on their particle size. Uh, the amorphous content 
chemical composition and the reactivity of harvested fly ash is very similar to parent fly ash when the particle size is similar. Bulk electrical resistivity can provide an indication of the reactivity. However, this property is highly complex. The amorphous content and particle size of materials can be used combinedly to uh, develop an index to get some idea of the reactivity of materials. Thank you. Thank you so much.